Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we are so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. Meg Meeker is a pediatrician, mother, and best-selling author of nine books, including Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters, and Boys Should Be Boys. She has been a physician practicing pediatric and adolescent medicine, working with children and their parents for over 30 years. Dr. Meg's life work has been to equip parents and children with the tools necessary for health and happiness, and ultimately to help strong parents build strong children for a brighter future. One of the country's leading authorities on parenting teens and children's health, Dr. Meg has four kids and lives with her husband in northern Michigan. Well, Meg, we are so honored that you would join us today. As we were just talking about, we have referred to your work. I think both of us, for as long as we've known about you, we've been telling other people about you, and your work has shaped a lot of our counseling practice and our work with kids and families, and we're just so grateful for your voice in the world and so honored you would take the time to share your voice with us today. So thank you for being with us. I'm happy to. Thank you. My heart is connecting with parents. And this is what I love to do is just talking to parents. Thanks for inviting me. You are our first pediatrician we've ever had on, which is really fun. And so we'd love to start with hearing kind of your journey into how that started for you. What got you interested in being a pediatrician? Well, the journey started probably 40 years ago. When I was 16, my father, who was a physician, hooked me up with a friend of his who was an orthopedic surgeon during the summer. We were working together, and I said, would it be okay if I came into the operating room and just watch you? He goes, oh, sure. Well, I fell in love with medicine Mm -hmm. right in that moment. And so from the time I was 16 until I went to med school, that's what I wanted. So I was pretty focused on that. When I was in college, I applied to all these medical schools senior year. And every letter came back saying, sorry, sorry, sorry. And the last one came back, said, we don't want you. And I was just devastated. I thought, what am I going to do? I'm 21. I have no plan B. And really something remarkable happened. I went home to live with my parents and I was walking past my dad's study one night and I heard him on the phone and I stood outside the door to listen to what he was saying. And I heard my dad say, yes, my daughter Meg will be going to medical school in the next couple of years. And I thought, what? (laughs) And he was so confident and he was so assured that I was going. And in that moment, I knew it was going to happen. Mm. And so I write about that in my Strong Father, Strong Daughters book, because the interesting thing is my dad doesn't remember saying that, but it was a pivotal 15 seconds in my life. And sure enough, I went on to medical school where I met my husband, Walt, and we just celebrated 40 years. Wow, congratulations. Congratulations. We opened our practice together, and we've been doing that. And I started writing books probably... In the late 90s. And I didn't ask to write a book. It kind of fell in my lap. I was upset in the late 90s about the sexualization of our kids. And I was seeing a lot of fallout from it in my practice, depression, infections, and this kind of a thing. And yet stores and marketers continued to market their stuff to teenagers and laced everything with sex. So I started speaking out about it. And Literally, there was an acquisition editor in the audience that I was speaking to, and she said, I've never heard this before. So that was the beginning of my writing career. I wrote a book, and I've just been going ever since. Mm. That's so wonderful. Well, and as Sissy said, we have all benefited from the fact that writing fell in your lap, and you've continued to do that. Thank you for how you've labored in doing that. How has pediatric medicine changed over the years since you started your work? Well, hugely. It really used to be a lot more fun. Mm. And the reason I say that is because we were wholly focused on our patients. 
And now, because there's so much stuff that's come in to kind of glop it up, if you will, we can't focus as much on our patients. For instance, when I first started, I'd walk into a patient's room. I had a manila folder on the outside of the door. You pick it up. I would scan everything. Okay, here are the problems I need to deal with. Go in, put it on my lap, and look at mom and the Mm. child. In pediatrics, there's a tremendous amount of observation that needs to take place. Watching mom and child interact. Is the baby's cry okay? Or what's the look on the teenager's face? You just learn so much. But now with electronic medical records, I have to sit there and turn away and type. Mm. So I lose a lot of that. I used to, for instance, write a diagnosis and everything I wanted to do in the paper chart. Now in the person's chart in my computer, I have to click here close out, move here, close out. Mm. We have, I think, 60,000 diagnoses that have been logged into our program. So when I want to put a diagnosis in, I have to click and find it and open it. It's just a nightmare. It's not that we're not computer savvy, because I am. I do all my work on computers. But it really has slowed us down so much. My partner, who's 20 years younger than I had to take a week off of work just to catch up on all of his charts that are in the computer. That's how slowed down he gotten. And so as one who just loves to interact and watch kids and talk with mothers and talk with kids, when you take my time and attention away from that and give me all this red tape, it really loses a lot of the fun. And it's very frustrating for me because I don't feel I'm doing as good of a job as a pediatrician. Mm. And that's a very common frustration that all doctors have across the board is that our focus is taken away from our patients and put onto computers and red tape and so Mm. forth. That makes so much sense. Well, what would you say as a pediatrician right now, your primary concerns are for children and for adolescents? We'd love to hear both. It's hard to know where to start. (laughs) No. My primary concern sort of working present data backwards. I'm very concerned about the amount of depression, anxiety I'm seeing in kids, particularly teenagers and young college students. It's through the roof. Kids that I never, ever would have imagined five or 10 years ago, I've seen kids through their growing up years would never have been depressed or anxious. And there's a lot of pressure on kids, performance pressure. They're separated from the nuclear family. And then you add on there something like isolation from COVID. It just puts kids over the edge. I think that the other things that are deeply concerning to me are the pressure on kids to identify, at least before they graduate high school, their sexual orientation and their gender. And we think, well, what is the big deal? I went and spoke at an arts academy several years ago, and this is very forward thinking, if you would, students and parents. They asked me to come because there was so much pressure on these kids to label themselves gay, straight, bi, and we didn't have trans, but now it's trans. So I said to the kids, I said, why don't we just shelve that and let's talk about you as a person. And I remember I looked up at the audience. I said, you as Jose, you as Rachel, you as Amanda. And you know, those kids jumped to their feet. You could see the relief on their faces that they had the permission not to hyper-focus on their sexuality and gender. Our culture is consuming them with this. And that's very, very hard for kids. And now that it's sort of moving down into grade school, kids can't handle what's coming at them. And so we have very confused kids. The intense sexualization of our kids continues down into elementary school. Kids are beginning to think about this. That shouldn't be. And I think that our culture has just put so much on our kids. They can't live freely. They can't figure out who they are as a person, as a human being, as a person created in God's image. That's very sad to me. It's so much in the front of their minds. It's really confusing for them. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it sure is. And that's a great transition into sharing that our season of the podcast, this season is called Modern Parents, Vintage Values, based on a book that Sissy and our colleague Melissa wrote together. And we'd love to ask you, what's a modern challenge you see parents facing? And what's one vintage value you think kids struggle with today? 
or how do you think we could help them with it? I think one of the biggest things that parents struggle with, I'll talk about moms because I see more mothers than fathers. Mothers feel so guilty because they're not ticking off all the boxes of what they feel they need to do to be really great moms. Mm. And they can never complete all those tasks during the day. And so they go to bed at night anxious and worried and guilty because they fed their kids McDonald's that day rather than a salad with kale in it. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that what's happened is over the years, Feminism came and the sexual revolution came and then women entered the workplace and then they wanted to do excellent in their jobs and then they wanted to do excellent at home and then they wanted to do excellent at both. And the list just kept getting longer and longer. And so I think that a lot of kids are living with mothers who live with a lot of angst. Mm. They're in pain because they're not enjoying their job as mom because they feel they're always falling short. And what happens is they focus on all the unimportant stuff rather than focus on the important stuff. I think the the impact that has on our kids is that kids are living with pretty wound up mothers. And I'm not pointing fingers. I can be as wound up as the best of them. I mean, (laughs) give me a deadline, I'm there. But I think what happens is then kids get wound up and kids feel this pressure that spills over from their parents. If you're a high performer... I need to be a high performer. Kids can't handle that pressure. So what I encourage parents to do is sort of peel back a layer or two and get back to the basics of being a great parent. And it's so simple. Mm -hmm. But the simplest things are the hardest things. For instance, spend 15 extra minutes a day with your kid. This was my rule. Don't let your kids do more than one extracurricular activity after school. I don't care how old they are, period. That's it. You know, they don't need piano and football and orchestra and acting. They can't. But parents feel they need to put their kids in this because if the child is going to excel at something, they don't want to be the person that held them back. And I tell parents, look, if your kid's going to be an Olympic ice skater, they're going to get there whether you put them in classes at four or not. And so... Spending time with your kids, that is time where you're not feeling guilty and uptight and what's going to be for dinner. And, you know, your kids would much rather spend time with you sitting in the backyard eating a Big Mac and talking than they would you in the kitchen frenetically running around because you're not making a good enough dinner and so on and so forth. And they're in the other room thinking, gee whiz, kids want a home environment that is calmer, that is quieter, that is less rushed. And in order for that to happen, it has to start with the parents, usually mom, because usually it's mom that sets the tone. I'm not trying to put a lot of guilt on mothers. I'm trying to free them up and say, just do less and be more with your kids. Take a bike ride, go to the park, go out to dinner, take a walk and forget about all the other stuff, because that's what your kids really crave, Mm -hmm. is time with a relaxed parent, because then kids feel they're being seen, they're being heard, someone's paying attention. Because kids don't feel like anybody's paying attention when mom or dad are sort of spinning in their own little tornadoes, usually looking on their phone. Kids don't feel that they're seen. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more what they remember. They don't remember the kale. Mm-hmm. You know, they remember the time spent. I love that. And like that conversation overhearing my father. When I was eight years old, my father used to take me to work with him. We lived in Boston. I had this very vivid picture of my dad after his work, holding my hand, walking down a sidewalk, and we went to get pastry at this particular store. And That is one of the most cherished, sweetest moments Mm. of my life. Mm. I don't remember all my sports games. I remember things my parents said and did with me. Mm. That's it. And that's what shapes a child's character. Mm. It's not all the stuff they do. It's just being next to their parent living life. Mm. That's beautiful. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Did you know that Minnow has an award-winning children's Bible? Written by VeggieTales creator Phil Vischer, 
The Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible for Kids is more than a children's Bible storybook. It's a deep, engaging, and whimsical gospel experience. Each Bible story is vividly illustrated, takes just minutes to read, and includes a family connection to encourage readers to learn, talk, and pray together. Find out more at shop.gominnow.com. That's shop.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. So if you were going to think about how much things have changed and what you wish you could bring back from your childhood, what you wish was still around, that we were still doing, what would you say? What I could bring back from my childhood, Mm -hmm. again, I don't want to put a lot of guilt on parents. I loved coming home from school and my mom was there. Mm -hmm. That made me feel so warm and so wonderful and great. And I would come in and I'd sit at the kitchen counter and she'd usually be cooking because in those days... You know, we didn't have McDonald's and that. And I would just sit there and start doing my homework, but it gave me so much security that she was there. Now, you can be available for your kids, move your time around or share with your husband. But I think what she really gave me was that she would listen to me. And there was a sense that I needed my mom and she was happy to give what I needed. And it was very, very simple. And again, it was that feeling that I had sitting in the kitchen, watching my mother cook. And that had a much bigger impression on me than doing a lot of stuff. My parents never pushed me to do stuff. My dad never said to me, you should go to medical school. Never. I just did it. There really was a sense that there was a family unit functioning together, and we weren't all autonomous beings who touched down at home periodically. Mm. And I think the push for autonomy, I don't need a husband, I don't need a wife, I don't need a kid, I don't need anything, I'm good. Oh, but if I happen to live with you, great. And if I happen to have a kid in the house, great. It doesn't work like that. There has to be this interdependence and this sort of social tight ecosystem that we create for our kids where there's a calm and a quiet and a love that's shared and attention and know that we're going to be there for each other. It really is pretty simple, but that would be one thing I would bring back is, is, you know, living with a sense of dependence, not autonomy Mm -hmm. in the family unit. That's great. Well, and along those lines, let's go old school for a minute. Tell us something you love from when you were a kid, like a favorite show, a favorite band, a favorite book. (laughs) <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, we'd love to hear. Yes. Okay. Gilligan's Island. Oh, yes. yes. I wanted to be Marianne. <laughs> okay. I really That's wanted great. to be Marianne. And then moments that I cherish, my dad made, we had four kids in our family, made us go on a two-week vacation up to Maine every summer. And we hooted and hollered, and I need to be here, and I need to be with my friends and everything. And we would go fishing. We would go into northern Maine near Mount Katahdin, and we go in the middle of nowhere. You know, when you're a 15, 16-year-old girl, it's just a nightmare. (laughs) But we would go, and we'd sit in a canoe, and we would fly fish. No music, no phones, nothing, just the quiet of the lake. And what I wouldn't do to get get just one of those days back. Mm. And my dad would smoke a pipe. And the smell of the pipe, Mm. just being in a canoe in the middle of nowhere, it's time I just cherished. And again, it was very, very simple. I didn't have to leave those years behind very long for me to appreciate how good that was and what a huge impact that had on my life. And even then the fact that my dad made us go, I hated it at the time. Mm -hmm. But now as a parent, my dad really loved us and wanted to be with us and made us go because he realized one day it was going to make a difference. And he didn't care if we didn't want to go. We were going to go. That's great. And I'm so grateful for that. That's great. Such a great reminder, too, for everyone who's listening and is talking about forcing their child to go on spring break or whatever vacation's next. You got to do it. I love that. You have to do it. The other thing that I think has really changed is that we ask kids 
what they want to do too frequently. And we let kids set the agenda for the day or the month or the year. Stop doing that. Because <laughs> kids don't know. Yes. When they're 25 and they look back on their lives, the things they're going to cherish are the things that you had them do because you are wiser and you know how to make great memories. Kids don't. They're not thinking about it. I think that parents, because they want their kids to be happy, allow their kids to drive the bus. Even when they're eight, stop doing it. Don't be afraid to do things even when your kids go, I'm not going to go. I hate that. You're a horrible (laughs) mother. Just tune it out and go. Yes. I love that. Okay. Well, as you're spending time with kids, I mean, what would you say gives you hope about kids today? Oh, I have tremendous hope. Mm. I have tremendous hope because I think that everything that is happening today with the pressure on kids and this hyper focus on gender and sexuality and sex and sexy language is going to come to bite us in the back. And I think that the next generation of kids, like my grandkids, okay, they're going to grow up and they're going to look at their parents and go, what were you thinking? (laughs) What were you thinking? Again, these life changing decisions that we're allowing 10 year olds and 15 year olds to make, it's going to stop because it's not sustainable. And so I have tremendous hope that the humanity of the person, the core value of the person, if you will, their identity as a human being, which I believe is that God made you in his image, will come out. Mm. It's going to burst out and it's going to come through all of this glop that we've put on kids, I know it will. I just know it will because I believe in kids and I believe in the spirit of kids. I believe in what God did. I believe that God put them here for a purpose and that's not going to go to waste, which is really what it's all about. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It is. You have shared such extraordinary wisdom in thinking about encouraging parents. Is there anything else that you would want to say to every parent you spend time with, something you'd want them to know? Give yourself a break. Mm. Tear up your list of things you need to do that day. And remember, your kids don't want you to run around like a crazy person. As a matter of fact, they hate it. Kids hate their parents being on a phone more than parents hate their kids being on a phone. Mm. Studies have shown that. Stop doing all the stuff that you do and work on just being with your kids. Play a game in the evening. Let them stay up an hour after their homework's done and just say, let's just play a game. Let me make some popcorn. Let's just do that. Skip the laundry. Skip that. And try to simplify. And any parent can do it. Parents want to do it, but they don't feel they have permission to do it. They're afraid they'll be a bad parent. And so what I would tell every parent out there is, I give you permission, as one who's done this 32 years and spoken to thousands of kids, I give you permission to let yourself off the hook and just enjoy your evenings. Because Mm -hmm. once you do that, the kids are going to follow right behind and you'll see a whole different dynamic in your home. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, will you tell us not only where folks can find you, but also if there's a project you're working on right now that you're excited about, we'd love to hear. Oh, I've always got a project. Oh, good. I create very, very short courses online, meekerparenting.com. But what I've started is a private community subscription, and I answer questions. I post videos. It's a teaching time. So I'm building an online community. It's, It's called Parenting Great Kids Community. We just have fun. Any question is okay to ask. I love the tough questions. You know, my 10-year-old came home from school and says she wants to be a boy. What do I do? Or I think my child has OCD. What do I do? Or I don't know when to take my child to the doctor. What do I do? So it's kind of like a huge kitchen table. That's what I love. Meekerparenting.com is my website, but the community is parenting great kids. And it's just fun. Sounds like it. We will put links to that in our episode notes and be excited for parents to explore that space. 
We like to end with kind of a fun question, building on the great things you said about connection enjoyment. We believe in that too. And one of our favorite ways to do that is with tacos. We get a lot of those around here. Just had them a few <laughs> minutes ago. We'd love to know if we ever got to share a meal with you, and we hope we do. What's your favorite taco? You know, it's funny. I was talking to my daughter about this today. This sounds weird. They're cauliflower tacos. Yes. But they're not just raw cauliflower. My daughter sautés the cauliflower in this wonderful hoisin sauce, throws in some other veggies, wraps it up in a taco, and it is so good. Yum. That would be my favorite. But I don't know where you find cauliflower tacos where you live. Bar Taco has them in Nashville. That's right. We've got some places. If you'll yes. just If you'll just come to our city, we'll take you to get some we great will. ones here, all right? I love Nashville. Because of COVID, I haven't been there often, but I love coming to Nashville. I could live in Nashville. It's such a great city. It is a great city. Well, if you travel back this direction at any point, we'll take you to get some great cauliflower tacos. (laughs) That would be great. Thank you so much for being with us and your wisdom and your warmth. And I just can't wait for folks to listen. Me too. We are so grateful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family with shows kids love and values parents trust. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.